Exobiology happens by proteins interacting with other proteins, other molecules, DNA, RNA, small molecules, ions, etc. So yeah, proteins super super important for the functions that we see in life um, and really enables the diversity that we see as well. Um, okay, cool. Yeah, so I think we have like a high level understanding of what proteins are. Proteins are really made up of these amino acids. So there are 20 canonical amino acids um, and they all share a very similar structure in the sense that they have this canonical amino um, group here and this carboxylic group here. Um, and they all have an R group as well, which really helps enable their variety of chemical um, and functional properties. So glycine, for example, has really no R group, has a hydrogen there. Um, but you can see there's a, these R groups really define what uh, kind of reactivity that they have. So there are some nonpolar ones that really are good for packing the core of a protein, um, kind of excluding themselves away from solvents. Um, there's some charged residues that really are important for salt bridging and interactions with other um, residues and small molecules, and et cetera. Polar residues also are very common um, and really popular on the surface because it's solvent exposed and solvent's usually polar. Um, yeah, so these are the building blocks that we're going to be using throughout the week. Um, and each of these items are connected together um, to form a larger polypeptide. And the way that they're connected is this peptide bond right here. So we have our uh, N, C alpha, C, um, and they're connected right here at the peptide bond. Um, these form two planes, really. So if you look at the um, N, C alpha, C, uh, this can be formed as a plane. These are typically on the same like level. Um, and then if you look at the, the residue next to it, you can form these two planes. And some of the most useful things here are these dihedral angles. So these define how skew the planes are relative to one another. Um, and these are really useful because they define a lot of properties of proteins. Um, for example, certain uh, phi psi angles really restrain what amino acids are preferred at this location. Um, it's really useful for helping predict side chain locations as well. Um, and yeah, each of them have an R group as well. Um, yeah, I think that's all I want to say about that. And as, uh, sorry, Virage, Virage yeah. yeah, mentioned, there are some different structures um, that we see within proteins. So the primary structure um, is really just the, the standard amino acid sequence. So each of them are connected in a polypeptide chain, one after another. Um, and then as we elongate this, uh, we eventually get more intricate structures. So they start forming into these alpha helices and beta sheets. There's some more uncommon structures as well. Um, and then these come together and interact and form a larger overall structure called the tertiary structure of the protein. This is really kind of the single chain structure um, and it's typically well-defined, although there are, proteins are, themselves are flexible and dynamic, so this isn't a static structure. Um, and there's also some proteins that don't have a set structure um, that are intrinsically disordered as well, or have regions that are intrinsically disordered. So not every protein has a well-defined tertiary structure. And now when these tertiary structures come together to form higher order oligomers, we have the quark matter structure that really defines how the proteins interact with one another. Um, and one of the, the most common examples is hemoglobin, um, which is super cool because there's also this allosteric effect and cooperativity. So there's a lot of fun things to talk about hemoglobin. Um, but these are the, the main overall structures. We're going to be looking at a lot of tertiary and quaternary structures throughout this class. Um, yeah, so I think that's proteins. Um, okay, um, now I also want to provide a little bit of refresher on what deep learning is. Uh, Ben's going to go over a lot more details during his mini session, um, but I want to provide a high level overview so you can at least understand what these models are doing, why they work, and then we'll get some intuition as we look at the very specific models themselves. So the first thing I want to talk about is data. Um, in the deep learning field, there's really this kind of uh, saying, garbage in, garbage out. So the, the quality of the data is super important. Your models are going to be learning from this data and they will replicate the patterns of the structures that they see within this data. So if you're giving it a bunch of garbage, a bunch of, I don't know, just random noise, it's going to not be able to learn anything useful from that. So you want to really make sure that the quality of the data is really nice. Um, another important thing to do is splitting up your data. So this is a very important for validating your models, for comparing them to other models and different architectures. Um, but it's also a way so that you can actually robustly benchmark and know how good your model actually is. So there's typically three splits that we do whenever we're doing deep learning. We have our training set, which makes up our majority of our split, usually around 80% or so. We also have a validation split and a test split. Both of these make up roughly 10% or so. 
Um, and these main splits are used in different ways. The main one, the training set, is used for actually training the model, as the name suggests. And what you do is you just put this through the model, you get some sort of output, and then you compute a loss. The loss is really some sort of cost function, maybe a measure of the error in the prediction. Um, and this is really a way to inform the model how to update its parameters, how to make a better decision in the end. And this loss is really dependent on the task you're doing. Um, you can imagine maybe classifying images into what animal they are, so a horse, a cat, a dog. Um, so your loss is a classification loss in that case. You could also imagine maybe trying to predict tomorrow's stock prices. That's a regression loss. So there's different forms of these loss functions that kind of depend on the task itself. Um, this process, there is a forward pass through the network, which is really just shuttling your data through the network and getting your loss function and computing that loss. And then there's the backward step. This takes your loss and pro back propagates its gradients, so it updates the parameters itself. So this is kind of how the learning happens. What you do is you take your data, throw it through the model, compute a loss, and you back propagate and update your model's parameters, and your model can uh, learn more that way. Um, What's happening kind of behind the scenes is this neural network, um, mostly common you'll see something like this, which is kind of like a fully connected diagram, where each of these dots represents a node or a neuron in the network. And they're fully connected in the sense that each neuron and each layer, so each vertical column is a layer, they're all connected to the previous one, and they're all connected to the next one. Um, what's happening here usually is really simple operations, like it's just a linear transformation and then you apply an activation function, which is some nonlinear function. Um, it's really kind of strikingly simple, um, and the kind of the complexity builds when you start layering these things one after another. And so it really starts ramping up complexity. Adding these nonlinear activations really enables it to capture these really complex features within the data that it sees, um, and allows it to actually also generalize to things that it hasn't seen before. You. So speaking of generalization. How do we actually measure that? Well, we also withheld these two sets, the validation set and the test set. These are used to evaluate how good our model is doing, how much is learning. Um, so when we're doing the model development, we might be changing the architecture or some different components, changing some internal parameters. Um, and how do we actually compare between those different versions of the model itself? We use the validation set. Um, we don't actually use the test set until the very, very end, until we've got a model architecture that we're satisfied with, because uh, Technically, the validation set is motivating some of the decisions you're making in the architecture itself and would um, technically be slightly learned on. Um, so the test set is what you're used at the very end to really validate your model's generalizability and how well it actually performs. And the test set is also really useful for comparing to other models that have a similar data split, and so you could actually validate what model's actually better than one another. Uh, the actual process for training is fairly simple. You follow this loop. So we do uh, training, we take our train data, throw it through the model, compute our loss, we back propagate that loss to update the model's internal parameters, and then we validate and compute how good we're learning, how much more steps we need. If we need to do more, if we're not, if we're not satisfied with that validation, we can train more and keep going this over and over and over again until we've updated the parameter parameters until we're satisfied with our validation score. Once we've satisfied with that score, we can go ahead and exit this loop and do our testing. So that's the kind of main overall idea of deep learning. Um, we learn from a bunch of data through these simple operations, really, and then you stack them to really enable the complexity um, of learning. We backpropagate our loss to update these weights. We um, score it with validation and testing to um, assess how well our models learned our data, and as well as measuring our generalizability to unseen data. Um, yeah, any questions? So why would you need a validation set if you have a testing set? So the main idea is because um, you can use the validation set to iterate upon different architectures. So the idea there is maybe, um, say right here we have two internal layers here, but you can easily swap that out for three, or you can try five, or you can try ten. How many do you try? So this is one way to actually be able to evaluate that. You're training all those models on the same data set, and then you validate on the same data set, and now you can select which of those model sizes gives you the best validation performance. Usually the bigger one's probably better, uh, but not always. Maybe it's overfitting more to the training set and less to the validation set. So that gives you a way to kind of separate the inter the, those different model architectures, um, and then once you've selected your final model, you throw that through the test set, so you can actually like 
publish that and then release it and then be comparative. Um, 